Something you might have noticed about oscilloscope music in art is that the brightness of an image isn't always consistent. Sometimes it's brighter, sometimes it's dimmer, sometimes an image might even contain a variety of brightnesses. But we only have this one knob here for controlling the intensity of the scope, so how is all this variability in brightness created? There is a few ways to go about this, and it's a very useful way to add another layer of interest to the images we can create on an oscilloscope. Let's take a look at how we can control the brightness of the beam on an oscilloscope without using the built-in control for beam intensity. Currently, I only know of two methods for controlling brightness. The first option is to add another channel of audio into the mix, giving us three total channels. Two for drawing the image, and one for brightness. Some scopes have a Z input on the back, which allows for this new channel to control the brightness of the beam. If you're looking to get a scope and aren't sure if that particular model has this capability, the best advice I can give you is to try and find the manual online and look for that information there. The scope I'm using for this video is the Tektronix 2246, and if we check out the manual for it, we can find all the information you might ever want to know. All we care about right now is checking if our scope has this Z input, so we can safely ignore all the technical details. Whatever scope you're using should have a similar section in its manual if it does have this special input for controlling brightness. This is the simplest way to do it, but not all scopes have this as an option, so if yours doesn't, that means we'll have to try something else. The alternative method involves controlling the speed of the beam. This seems like it would be complicated, and sometimes it can be a little tricky, but conceptually it's pretty simple. The basic idea is this. The more time the beam of the scope spends at a particular location, the brighter it gets. The less time, the dimmer. When we're moving slow, we spend more time at each location, therefore making it brighter, and as we speed up, we spend less time, making it dimmer. The quirky part is that it's not really about the speed, it has more to do with the relationships between speeds. More on this later. So these are our two methods, using the Z input if the scope has it, or controlling the speed of the beam. I'm going to tackle the Z input method first because it's relatively straightforward to implement and understand. Set up your audio interface to output three channels instead of two, and plug your third channel into the Z input on the scope. Let's start simple and use our third channel to control how dim or bright a circle is. We can do it simply by manually changing the value we send out of the third audio channel. Every scope is different, so the specific numbers that will work here will be different for everyone. In fact, because of the analog nature of the circuitry, even on a day-to-day -day basis, these values will move around a bit. What I've created here is about as basic as it gets, but there's a couple things worth observing. First off, notice how the values that are useful don't have a super wide range. At the time of writing this script, the output range was only 0.3 to 0.43. Also, notice how if we increase the brightness with the intensity controls on the scope itself, this range changes. If I turn the intensity all the way down, our Z input doesn't do anything, and when I increase it, the range of usable values shifts up. In this case, you can think of the intensity knob on the scope as simply controlling the range, although this isn't quite accurate. What I think is most important to realize here is that the brightness of the beam changes how thick or thin the line making our circle is. If it's too bright, our lines lose a lot of their sharpness. If we had a really complex image we wanted to draw with many fine lines, we'd need to be careful with our maximum brightness, since in general, one of our goals is to make the image as crisp as possible. Doing this manually is a bit of a pain and has a fairly limited usefulness for us, so let's check out some different effects we can create from automating it. One fun thing to do is use a separate oscillator at a slightly different frequency than the one drawing your image, especially different multiples of the main oscillator, and watch the cool patterns that arise from the frequencies being out of sync. Changing the waveform we're using can be fun to mess with as well. One improvement we could make is to map the numbers to the range of values that the scope will actually respond to. Our sine wave here ranges from minus 1 to 1, and using this equation, we can give it our current range and the range we want to map it onto. Manipulating the range of values this way gets us a little bit more use out of the tiny range of brightness available on the scope. If you've ever used processing before, this works exactly the same as the map function. I won't explain how this equation works, but there's some links in the description if you're interested in the details. Another thing we could do is emulate the trace effect we created in an earlier video, and turn the beam on and off depending on the phase of our circle. 
we can use the less than tilde object to check if our phase is less than a certain number, and if it's true, the beam is on, and if it's false, the beam is off. Because we're controlling the brightness and not the actual phase used to draw the circle, the effect is similar to, but not quite the same, as if we had done it by directly manipulating the phase. Visually, it's very similar, but they don't sound the same at all. Another thing we could do is control the brightness based on location. For example, we could make the circle dimmer when its x value is less than zero. As always, throwing oscillators on things at frequencies that are close to, but not quite the same as, the main frequency is a good bet for finding something interesting. When working with brightness, I find it's useful to apply a bit of a more advanced mapping function to make the most out of the range that we do have. In general, the scope tends to favor bright spots over dark, so we'll want to expand the range of the darker spots and spend less time in the brighter ones. Additionally, the brighter spots also have a tendency to bleed over into dim spots that are nearby, so getting the brightness just right is quite difficult if we just pass in this phaser directly to control the brightness. To achieve a smoother gradation from dark to light, if whatever I'm using to control brightness is not already ranging from 0 to 1, I'll map it to that range using the same equation from before, then raise that to some power, and then map it back to the range that works for the scope. Getting this just right is pretty fiddly. You'll need to work with all the parameters at once, adjusting the output range, the intensity control on the scope, and the power you raise your signal to. Spending a few minutes tweaking the values to be just right gave me something that looked like this. Notice how much smoother the transition from dark to light is for the one where we spent a little extra time remapping the range. What I've created here works well enough, but could definitely be improved. While working with this third input is quite a flexible way to do things, there's a few drawbacks. The first one we just talked about, the range of brightness is really not that large, and we have to do a bit of work if we want a smooth transition from dark to light. The other less important problem is that there's not a great way to get this third audio channel to be audible when you can only output in stereo. You could just layer it into the audio you've already got going on, but then if people try and play back your track on their own scope at home, it won't display properly. Maybe this is a problem for you, maybe it isn't, but if you do want to keep that audio around to go with your visuals, this approach adds another wrinkle to the mix. If your scope doesn't have a Z input, we'll have to do all this in a different way. Earlier, I mentioned that you can control the brightness by changing how long the beam stays at a certain location. Let's go back to the circle example, but this time let's see how we can control its brightness by altering the speed at which it's drawn instead. This will involve manipulating the phase, so if you're confused about what phase is, or what it even means to manipulate it, check out my previous video on the subject. Right now, the phaser drawing the circle ramps through all possible phases equally. Or said in another way, it's a linear ramp from 0 to 1. Each spot in the circle is drawn for the same amount of time. We need to find a way to spend more time at some spots in the phase, and less time in others. Before I show you, I encourage y'all to pause the video and think about different ways we can manipulate the phase to achieve this. And the answer is... squaring the phase. Well, there's actually many ways we could achieve this, but I like this one because I think it's pretty clear. Looking at a graph of our output, when we raise our phase to the second power, we increase the time spent at lower numbers, and as we get larger, we quickly ramp to 1. What I like about this is that we don't have to worry about the phase somehow not ranging from 0 to 1, because 1 to any power will always be 1. If we increase the power we raise the phase to, it spends more and more time at the beginning. If we crank it high enough, we eventually don't even draw the whole circle and just get this dot at the start. The sound gets pretty wild as well. The main reason we'd want to do it this way is that sound and image maintain a one-to-one -one correlation and are still only using two channels of audio instead of three, neatly sidestepping the potential issue we encountered earlier. We can then add an offset to this, and now this little bright spot will move around the circle. What's cool about this technique is that it doesn't matter what we're drawing. This will work on anything, since all we're doing is manipulating the phase. Now that we've returned to using only a stereo audio signal to create the images on our scope, we can also implement this in Aussie Studio. In this particular area, Aussie Studio really excels because of this special little class called Remapping Tree, 
that allows you to do some really intricate things with phase that are feasible, but rather painful to do in PD. I won't explain the inner workings of the remapping tree because that would really deserve a video or two of its own, but I'll show y'all how to start making use of it. First, we'll include the header file and then we can create a new remapping tree. This number in between the carrots is kind of like the sample rate of the tree. The higher this number is, the better it will do its job, but the slower it'll run. Setting this to a few thousand is usually fine, but you'll have to experiment with it to get it just right. I'm going to pound define n to be 2000. This number will get us in the ballpark. Then to make use of the tree in our gen method, we can create a vector as usual, and then instead of passing the phase t straight to our input, we'll pass it to the tree using its remap method and then pass that to input. All this member method does is take an input phase and then based on how the tree has been constructed, we'll adjust the phase accordingly, Again, getting into the weeds of how this works is a bit complicated, so for now, knowing that this is the function we want to call in gen is enough. Once I make a video about phase cutting, we can take a closer look at how remapping tree works. All we've done so far though is to declare that the tree exists. We need to actually tell it how we want to build one. To do this, we can use Aussie Studio's update method. If there's some data that we want to be regularly updated, but not necessarily at the audio rate, we can do that there. Usually, we do something like this where we only update if the timeline is playing using beat grid, but in this case that doesn't matter so much, so we won't wrap our code in an if statement. The other main methods that we'll want to make use of with this class are set weight with index and set weight with t. These two methods are how we'll increase or decrease the brightness at different portions of the image. Using set weight with t, we can do a simple check on our phase, similar to how we did it before in PD and if it's above a certain value, set it to the brightness we want. The code for this is short and sweet, but there's a few things going on here, so I'll take a moment and walk through the different pieces. The easiest part is probably this if-else statement, where we set the weights based on where we are in the phase. The trickier parts are the actual numbers that we use for set weight with t, and how we're actually calculating t. Since we're in Aussie Studio's update method, we don't get access to Jen's t parameter. This is why we have to create it ourselves. Since our tree has n samples, and we know that phase is just a number ranging from 0 to 1, we create this fraction where the denominator is n, the number of samples in our tree, and the numerator is an index that runs through all values of n. In this way, we'll reach all values of t, aka phase, and can then set the weights for the tree. Earlier, I had mentioned that brightness was more about the relationships between speeds rather than the actual speeds themselves. The values used in set weight with t is where we can see this manifesting. The tricky thing is, if we give everything the same weight, everything will have the same brightness, no matter what number we pick, other than zero of course. So the difference in brightness is all about the relationships between the speeds of the phase. This is probably why they're called weights in Aussie Studio. Things that have more weight get more of the total phase. Showing a graph of what I mean might make this a bit clearer. We can actually look at this on our scope if we adjust our gen method like so. First, let's draw our phase with respect to time with nothing fancy going on. We get a diagonal line, and this is why I keep calling this a linear ramp. In our code, when Aussie Studio adjusts the phase with its weights, this happens. It's still a line, but based on the weights we gave it, it will adjust the speed at each point in the phase while still maintaining the overall frequency. If we set the weights to both be the same number, we can see that the line looks exactly the same as if we had done nothing at all, which is what we expect to happen. To summarize this idea, controlling brightness is all about changing the speed of the phase and the relationships between those speeds. Let's take a look at some other things we can do with the remapping tree. If we wanted to set the brightness based on the location on the screen, then we'll want to use set weight with index instead, along with some other tweaks to the code we'll need to get the vector so that we can access its location using the input method. Then in our if statement, we can say something like, if the location is less than some value or greater than some value, set it to the weight we want, else just give it a weight of one. And everything else remains the same. Messing around with the bounds and the weight, this seems to be working nicely. Here's some examples that expand on these ideas a little bit. We can create a square-shaped hole that we move around by making our if statement a little more complicated, or if we flip the weights, a square-shaped window. Things get extra funky if we turn off the rotation that is before the remapping and instead rotate after. Something to think about here is, how are we getting a square window on both sides of our icosahedron? 
So that's pretty much the gist of it. Obviously, this is only scratching the surface of what's possible, but honestly, just using a couple of the things I've shown here and gaining a bit of an intuitive understanding of how brightness works on oscilloscopes is a great place to be. There's a whole lot of depth that can be added to otherwise simple or perhaps slightly flat feeling images just by adding in some brightness modulation.